um, we are very happy to have Jerome today. Uh, tell us about brains on spindle. Great. Well, it's really nice to see you, uh, so many of you virtually. Uh, it'd be nice to see you again live. Hopefully that's soon. Um, I wanted to um, uh, give a little summary of uh, uh, some work I've been doing during the pandemic. Um, there's these four papers, mostly in collaboration with uh, Dario Matali and James Sparks, um, and also in uh, with two of James's students, Pietro Fiera and Juan Hapina, and uh, a final paper, which I'll say a little bit about with uh, Davide Cassani. Um, so I, I, let me just take you back a little bit and um, just remind you of the very uh, rich story that we, um, I'll give you a flavor of the rich story that we understand concerning generalizations of, or um, versions of the supersymmetric ADS-CFT correspondence associated with brains uh, wrapping cycles. So the basic examples, um, of course, very well known to everyone here, uh, D3 brains associated with ADS-5 cross S5, M5 brains, ADS-7 cross S4, M2 brains, ADS-4 cross S7, and these are dual to these field theories on the right-hand side, um, and they all have R symmetries associated, not a billion R symmetries associated with the uh, isometry group of the uh, relevant sphere on the left-hand side. So the, the rap brain uh, story began with a, uh, a seminal paper by uh, Juan Maldacena and Carlos Nunes about 20 years ago. Um, and they started asking the question, can we consider um, versions of this where the brain um, is wrapped on some cycle, some p-dimensional cycle, and we have some non-compact uh, Poincaré invariants piece. And we want to preserve supersymmetry and hopefully uh, flow in the infrared to another conformal field theory. And then that should give rise to uh, new examples of, of um, ADS-CFT with supersymmetry, which we can uh, explore. Um, so regarding the First point, the preser preservation of supersymmetry, a paradigm that's been very central to all these developments is something called the topological twist, which um, goes back to Witten in 1988. And the simple idea is that if you wanna put a, a conformal field theory um, on this curve background, one way in which you can do it uh, and preserving supersymmetry is to um, couple the background field theory to asymmetry currents, and then trade off in the um, killing spinner equation, spin connection pieces with background asymmetry pieces in such a way that you have constant spinners on the cycle. So as I said, this is not the only way, but this has been a, a central uh, and very powerful paradigm uh, to preserve supersymmetry. Um, and there's a Ge nice geometric correspondence uh, or viewpoint for this, which goes back to Bashatsky, Sadov, and Baffa. And you can view it as follows to start with 10 or 11 dimensional supergravity on a background that preserves supersymmetry. So let's switch off the fluxes, and therefore the background um, should have some special holonomy, which could be Calabi Yau or G2, hypercalor or spin seven. And then you wrap a brain about a calibrated cycle. So from a pro point of view, you know that preserves supersymmetry. And if you analyze in detail the, um, the way in which uh, that pro brain preserves supersymmetry, you will see that uh, it's exactly realizing that this topological twist as described here. So let me just uh, go uh, review some examples. So the first example in, in Maldacena Renuna's original paper um, considered two cycles, and I'll just go through the example of five brain dropping calibrated two cycles, which are holomorphic two cycles, uh, holomorphic two cycles in either a Calabi R twofold or a Calabi R threefold. So you wrap those five, five brains on some holomorphic cycle inside the Calabi R2, and um, what they constructed was a, um, a solution which in the UV looks like ADS-7 cross S4, uh, with the slices of ADS-7 uh, R14 cross 
sigma two. And then in the infrared, it flows to ADS5 across sigma two. So this con concretely realizes a flow across dimensions where you start off with the six dimensional field theory compactified on this uh, two cycle. And then in the infrared, you realize uh, an ADS5 geometry that's dual to an N equals two supersymmetric conformal field theory. Um, similarly, you can wrap a five brain on uh, a holomorphic curve inside a Calabi R threefold, and the corresponding solutions that they constructed then uh, are much the same, but now they're preserving just half as much supersymmetry. And in these constructions, that is these explicit supergravity solutions that they constructed, uh, the metric on sigma two is a constant curvature metric. So sigma two is a Riemann surface with a constant curvature metric. Now, uh, it's difficult uh, to do so, but um, it's certainly possible, and it was shown that solutions should exist where in the UV, instead of starting off um, with a Riemann surface with constant curvature metric, you can start off with a Riemann surface with a curve metric, and you should still flow to these same uh, geometries in the, in the IR. So they had an existence proof of that. So the UV data, the details of the curve metric should get washed out and you should get to these nice constant curvature metrics in the infrared where su supersymmetry is being realized by the topological twist. Um, there's an analogous story for wrapping D3 brains and M2 brains on two cycles, which I want to, don't want to go into anymore. And for five brains and D3 brains, we have more dimensions and we can wrap three cycles and four cycles and even five cycles in a similar way. And there's associated uh, ADS solutions that are dual to those configurations. There's many other developments. I also don't want to review in any detail, but let me just mention one that will be important which is a generalization involving Sasaki-Einstein spaces. And as I'll remind you um, a little bit later, uh, just the, we can have these conformal field theories that re realize on stacks of M2 brains at the apex of Calabi R4 fold cones, or D3 brains at the apex of Calabi R3 fold cones. Um, they give rise to conformal field theories, which we know a lot about, quiver gauge theories and so on. Um, and then you can take those CFTs and wrap on a Riemann surface with a topological twist. And um, there's again an analogous story, which was initiated by Benini, Bova, and Crescinia in 2015. OK, so what I want to do that's new um, is, is wrap D3 brains, M brains, and five brains on a spindle. And there's two um, nice new features of, of this story. Firstly, the spindle is not a smooth manifold. In fact, has, uh, it has, it's an orbifold. Um, and there's orbifold singularities, which I'll review in a moment. And secondly, that supersymmetry is not being realized by the usual topological twist. So these are two new features and um, we've begun to explore uh, the landscape of possibilities. And there's certainly more to do beyond what I'll tell you about. Um, if you Google spindle, uh, this is what you'll come up with. Um, this is a, a device which you uh, take some yarns of wool, uh, sorry, you take some uh, shorn wool, and then you spin this thing, and then you get a, a ball of wool, and then you can go away and knit. And I'm sure that these things have been very popular during the pandemic. People have taken up all sorts of hobbies. This is not at all uh, what to do with the spindle I want to talk about, and I'm, I'm not sure why the nomenclature is the same, but a spindle is um, a specific uh, kind of orbifold. And here it is, so here is a definition. So it's uh, specified by two integers, which I'll call n minus and n plus, um, and the uh, integers which I'll take to be positive, and they have no common factors. So a relatively prime pair of uh, positive integers. And topologically, we have a two sphere, as in this indic in, as in the figure I've drawn here, and as similarly drawn in this figure, at the north and south pole of this two sphere, there's conical deficits. And the conical deficits are quantized and specified by these integers n plus and minus. 
Um, we can also give another definition of the orbifold as just being a weighted projective space where the weights um, uh, are given by these integers n minus and n plus. So you take C2 and then you quotient out by a U1 action um, with weights n minus n plus acting on the two copies of C2. So this is uh, an example of an orbifold. Obviously, in string theory, orbifolds famously are um, backgrounds in which you can put string theories on, where you take some uh, torus and then you divide it out by some um, discrete group with, which has fixed points. Uh, th this definition of orbifold is more general. An orbifold here is it's uh, defined to be a manifold. Oh, well, as a manifold is locally given by um, little patches of Rn. Um, and then suitably patched together with um, smooth functions, an orbifold is um, locally modeled on Rn mod gamma, where gamma is some discrete group, and then you patch together those uh, consistent with the discrete identifications. And here is a very specific example of such an orbifold. Now, it's a fact that uh, constant curvature metrics don't exist on um, spindles. Um, and that will implicitly mean that the solutions, which I was just describing, the ADS5 solutions, the RAP5 brains, that where there was a constant curvature metrics on the Riemann surface, if we can get analogous solutions, they're certainly not going to have constant curvature metrics on them. You can calculate the Euler character uh, of an orbifold, and in particular for um, the uh, um, the spindle is just given by the sum of the reciprocals of these two integers. So you can just use gauss bonnet and integrate root gr and divide by appropriate factor to get this Euler character. So that's a spindle, um, which uh, will be what we'll wrap the brains on in, in the coming rest of the talk. So what, the way I've planned that is um, uh, I'll first talk about D3 brains wrapping on a spindle, and um, we'll be able to get the uh, infrared physics of that by, in other words, um, well, I'm jumping ahead, that when you do wrap the D3 brains on a spindle, you do get a conformal field theory in infrared, and um, there's correspondingly an ADS3 solution, which is what I'll discuss. In fact, the ADS3 solutions were first found from a completely different point of view back in 2006, um, and for 15 years, it, it was completely obscure uh, what the dual field theories were. But this new uh, angle involving spindles gives a, a clear um, conjecture of what the dual field theory is. Um, and we can then do a precision test by doing uh, C extra extremization um, on the field theory and the gravity and checking with the predictions for gravity. For membranes, um, there will be uh, correspondingly infrared physics associated with ADS2 solutions, but there's also, we're able to um, get solutions which also, also capture the UV. So it looks like ADS4 in the UV and then goes down to ADS2 in the IR. In fact, these are uh, therefore supersymmetric black hole solutions. And somewhat remarkably, um, it's the black hole solutions is an old class of black hole solutions built on um, C metric associated with accelerating black holes. So we'll have a new interpretation of accelerating black holes and actually a new way of desingularizing the conical singularities of black holes. And if there's time, which I'm not sure there will be, but let's uh, see how we go. I'll say something about um, uh, M5 brains and I'll say something about them one way or another in the summary. Okay, so I wanna start by um, uh, a quick review of Sasaki Einstein manifolds because they'll play a key role in both the constructions of the wrapped D3 brains and the, the wrapped M2 brains. But let me just see if there's any uh, questions before I um, launch into, the, into this. Okay, as there's no questions, um, I'll, I'll, I'll continue on. So um, the brief review of Sasaki Einstein, 
um, we recall that if we take some D3 brains at the apex of a Calabi R threefold cone, by definition, the cross section of the cone is a Sasaki Einstein manifold. That's a, an equivalent, a, a precise definition of what a Sasaki Einstein manifold is. And if you zoom in on the D3 brains, then you get to this ADS5 cross Sasaki Einstein 5 solution with just five form flux. Um, and these are dual to n equals one formal field theories in d equals four, except for the special case when SE, this is like Einstein is the five sphere and then it's dual to n equals four Yang Mills theory. Similarly, for M2 brains at the apex of a Calabi R four fold cone, you get rise to a conformal field theory that's dual to this ADS4 cross the Saki Einstein seven solution, and there's just electric four form flux. And these are dual to two dimensional conformal field theories in three dimensions. Um, and much is known about both classes of these four and three, three dimensional field theories. And in a moment, I'll want to take those field theories and wrap them on uh, a spindle or correspondingly consider this geometric construction and then add in a further wrapping on a spindle. So let me just say one or two more things about the geometry here. The Sasaki Einstein manifolds have a canonical killing vector we call it xi, and that's dual to the R symmetry of the dual field theories, both the n equals one field theory in four dimensions and the n equals two uh, supersymmetric field theory in three dimensions have an R symmetry, and that's geometrically realized by this killing vector on the Sasaki Einstein internal manifold. And if we let E to be the one form that's dual to this vector, then the metric can be uh, on the Sasaki Einstein manifold can be put in this canonical form. So it's a five, locally a vibration or the tangent space splits into this one dimensional piece given by this one form eta, and then a positive curvature Kähler-Einstein manifold in the transverse directions. And moreover, this um, uh, structure is such that the, the exterior derivative of this one form is given by the Ricci form of this Kähler-Einstein manifold, which in turn is proportional to the Kähler form of that k right side manifold. Now, depending on this, whether the orbits of this um, uh, vector uh, close or, or not, you can classify Sasaki Einstein manifolds into either the regular class, which corresponds to having a U1 vibration over a Kähler Einstein manifold, there's a quasi regular case where it's a U1 vibration over a Kähler Einstein orbifold, and finally, an irregular class where the asymmetry orbits don't close at all. And what we'll be interested in is this, um, primarily in this regular class. So you want vibrations over Kähler Einstein manifolds as opposed to orbifolds or just this intrinsic five dimensional story. And in five dimensions, there's actually a full list and here they are. We can have the Kähler Einstein as CP2, CP1 cross CP1 or one of these Del Pezzo surfaces where you take CP2 and blow it up at a number of points. And the corresponding Sasaki Einstein 5 manifolds are, in this case, S5 or a discrete quotient, which still preserves n equals 1 supersymmetry. Uh, uh, this one is T11, or again, a Z2, which still preserves n equals 1 supersymmetry. And these ones don't have a name. And D equals 7, well, it's not a, this is not a full list, but just some old favorites. We can take CP3, the product of three. Uh, spheres or a product of CP2 cross CP1. And these are the Sasaki Einstein manifolds on the right hand side. So these are all examples. This is the full set of examples of regular Sasaki Einstein. And here's a flavor of regular Sasaki Einstein in five dimensions. And this is a flavor of the, um, the types of seven dimensional regular examples. So we want to construct supergravity solutions corresponding to these four dimensional conformal field theories that are dual to ADS5 cross the Sarkia Einstein 5. And then you replace that four dimensional field theory R11 cross the spindle. And the same is true or the same, we have the same a goal to wrap uh, the, or place this three dimensional conformal field theories on R cross sigma. So how, how do we do this? Well, the tool we can use here very effectively is consistent kaluza klein truncations. So if we start with 2B, type 2B supergravity, and then we reduce on a five-dimensional Sasaki-Einstein manifold, 
then there's a consistent truncation to five dimensional minimal gauge supergravity. That, what that means is that any solution of this five dimensional theory, whose field content is just the metric and, the, and a, uh, a gauge uh, vector field, any of those solutions can be uplifted on an arbitrary Sasaki Einstein five to give you an exact solution of type 2b. So it's capturing a universal sector uh, of all these conformal field theories. Uh, and similarly, for the 11 dimensional case, if you collusive climb reduce on a seven dimensional Sasaki Einstein, you get down to minimal gauge supergravity in four dimensions. So these solutions, which we want to be dual to these brains wrapping on these spindles, are first constructed in these uh, minimal gauge supergravities in five and four dimensions. And then we uplift on the Sasaki Einstein five and Sasaki Einstein seven. And that uplifting actually has some interesting features, uh, which I'll, I'll highlight in a moment. So here is the solution corresponding to D3 brains wrapped on a spindle. Um, and it's not that complicated. So in fact, almost all of the details of the solution are just here. So the five dimensional Grangian is just a kinetic term, negative cosmological constant and a Maxwell term for the gauge field. And there's a churn simons coupling. And a solution to the equations of motion, which is ADS3 cross a spindle, um is given here so here is the five dimensional metric there's just the metric on a unit radius ads3 uh here is the metric on the spindle which um is parameterized by a coordinate y and a compact killing direction uh parameterized by z and you see that the metric here is a warp product of ads3 cross ds2 because there's a function here y this same coordinate here which is uh, warping the ads3 factor but this has all the isometries of ads3 so it's uh, a dual to um, a, a two-dimensional conformal field theory um, so let's look at this uh, and see why it's a spindle so ds squared um, sigma we have this coordinate y and there's this function q which is appearing here and here and Q is just this cubic function of Y that depends on a constant A. And the gauge field um, is given by this expression here. And then you see it's a function of Y uh, and this constant A appears here. So the solution is extremely simple. Just depends on this uh, one cubic function depending on one parameter A. So the spindle um, solution, or the solution corresponding to the spindle needs to be specified by two more bits of information. One is what the period of Z is. Well, we will make it a periodic direction, but I have to tell you what the period is. And secondly, I have to tell you what A is. And the way in which we fix this free data is simply to take our cubic. First of all, demand there's three real roots. And then we choose, or you want to choose Y, um, to lie between two roots in which Q is positive. So in particular, when we get to the two roots, you see from the metric here, the function of Q here, the size of the circle direction parameterized by Z is shrinking to zero. So it's zero size here, it's zero size here, it's finite size in between. So that's topologically a two sphere. Um, but it turns out that you can't choose the parameters in this solution, A and the period of Z, to make it smooth at both ends. You could make it smooth at one end, but you can't make it smooth at both ends. And more generally, if you choose A to be this rather complicated look function of N plus and N minus, and the period of Z to be this corresponding function of N plus and N minus, and you go through uh, the details, you find that the degeneration at the two poles of this two sphere are precisely such that it is a spin. So this is the ADS3 cross spindle solution. Um, and it preserves, I'm not going to tell you any of the details, but it does preserve a chiral 0, 0,2 supersymmetry in two dimensions. Okay, so uh, a few more facts about this. 
is, well, I, there's, there's the gauge field uh, here, the potential. And if you can calculate the flux, you, you get a non-zero flux through a spindle and it's given by this quantized value here. And this construction is certainly not the topological twist, which I was alluding to at the beginning of the talk, because in the, the topological twist, the flux, the R symmetry flux through the Riemann surface with the R symmetry identified with the spin connection um, on the Riemann surface, the flux would be equal to the Euler character. And I told you before that the Euler character on a spindle is given by this expression. And so in particular, we see that these are not equal. So the way in which supersymmetry is being realized is not by the topological twist. Uh, moreover, the killing spinners, which I'm not going to write down, but you can calculate them with after a, a bit of work, and you the uh, complicated functions of the coordinate y, and in particular, they're not they're not constant. Can I ask a question, Jerome? Sure. Uh, is QM the flux uh, through the smooth part of the spindle, or does it include the uh, potentially contributions uh, from the singular points? It includes everything. So it, you can calculate it by just, I mean, literally just integrating F uh, across the whole, whole of the spindle. So, uh, and, so and all, all the folds are a very benign or a very simple kind of generalization of the manifold. So there is a line, there's a corresponding line bundle and F is a churn class of that, of that line bundle. And it, it is obtained by simply doing the integral in a straightforward way, just like the Euler character is via gauss Bonnet. Thanks. Okay, so, so we have our solution. Um, and now we want to uplift of, of five dimensions. And now we want to uplift in, um, on Sasaki Einstein 5. And we will uplift just on the regular class which was those del ones associated with the del pezzos or the conifold or the phi sphere. And what's quite remarkable is that when you uplift on these Sasaki Einstein five manifolds, the 10 dimensional solution is completely smooth. A subtlety is, um, or the way in which this happens is which Sasaki Einstein you uplift on uh, to be smooth depends on what those integers are. So for example, if M plus is even, or it's two, then uh, if M minus is three, seven, and so on, in the case of CP2, you uplift on S5 mod Z3. If it's five, nine, and so on, then you should uplift on, um, uh, on, 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 the, on the five sphere itself. Now this might sound uh, hard to think about. So you've got the spindle downstairs and we've got a Sasaki Einstein five upstairs. What, what's happened to the singularity, the Orbifold singularity? Well, I'm not gonna go through the analysis specifically here, but I wanted to explain why that's not in fact, or a very simple version of why you shouldn't be surprised about that. So let's consider um, the metric on S3, just uh, to give you, to explain the key point. So here I've written down the metric on three sphere in uh, coordinates theta phi one and phi two, theta ranges from zero to pi on two, and there's two u1s uh, which have um, uh, coordinates phi with period two pi. So um, one of these circles degenerates at one end of the interval of theta and the other circle generates the other one. Now, if we do a Kluge's climb reduction, using a killing vector d by d phi one plus d by d phi two, that is of this form here when m plus and m minus is one, that would just give you the usual hop vibration or display the usual hop vibration of the three sphere over the two sphere. But let's imagine instead we do a reduction or we consider this vector n plus d, phi, d by d phi one plus n minus d by d phi two when m plus and m minus uh, co-primed positive integers, relative uh, co-primed positive integers, then you find in fact a U1 over a spindle, vibration over a spindle. And you can, you can well, I, in fact, I've, the calculation here, you can go and verify it yourself afterwards in about 10 minutes is, um, is as follows. So just simply introduce new coordinates, phi one, phi two, uh, in terms of, sorry, introduce new coordinates, new and mu related to phi one and phi two like this. 
and with a bit of effort, a uh, bit of thought, you can convince yourself that mu and nu both have period two pi. And the virtue of choosing these coordinates is the killing vector where I'm, we're thinking about is now just d by d mu. So we just take this metric, rewrite it a la Kaluza Klein in this form, and you'll see that it's now a U1 vibration over a base space. And this base space parameterized by theta and mu, and mu has period two pi, is such that if you just think about this function here with lambda given there, it'll degenerate at the two poles, but now there'll be precisely orbifold singularities with conical deficits determined by n plus or minus. So there's a very simple way in which two sphere, uh, sorry, the spindle adding in a circle can be, can be desingularized because in this case, you're just getting up to the three sphere. And this construction I was alluding to here, you have to work a little bit harder, but not too much harder. Um, you start with your spindle or the solution that we have here with the spindle. We add the Sasaki Einstein five. And remember the Sasaki Einstein five is a U1 vibration over the um, Kähler Einstein. And that's, it's that using that extra U1 vibration structure to desingularize in the right way. Um, and in fact, these ADS3 cross sigma cross the Psyche Einstein five, so it's not, it's not actually a direct product as indicated here, but it's exactly what I was just describing. Um, this, this is fibered over the space sigma and to give a, a seven dimensional manifold, which is a completely regular and smooth manifold. These were the solutions that Naku Kim and Dan Waldron and I constructed in 2006 from quite a different point of view, which I'll briefly allude to at the very end of the talk. So we constructed these solutions back in 2006, perfectly regular, supersymmetric, they're dual to some two-dimensional conformal field theories, but we had no uh, understanding of what the dual field theory could be. But this different point of view, which I've just been explaining to you, tells you um, or informs one exactly what the dual field theory should be. Take the D3 brain, sorry, take the CFT dual to the um, ADS5 cross the Psyche Einstein 5, take that field theory and wrap it on a Riemann, uh, wrap it on a spindle and then flow to the infrared. And that is the, the dual um, configuration. We can work out the central charge from the gravity side and um, use using Cardi's formula, uh, sorry, Brown and Henault's formula. And we get to this, this result here. So we, in this paper in 2006, we had written down the central charge, but we hadn't written down in this form, we'd written down in a, an equivalent version. But here I've emphasized the four dimensional central charge, a central charge of the four dimensional conformal field theory dual to ADS5 cross the Psyche Einstein five. And then there's, this is now dressed with these uh, integer factors determined by the spindle data M plus and M minus. So we then have a precise conjecture of what the dual field theory is. Um, we have a central charge. So can we test that? Uh, and we can. <clears throat> we can do a field theory computation now to test that conjecture. So we go, uh, we, we utilize the, um, uh, the CX romanization principle of Benini and Bobev, which is um, <clears throat> the central charge of a two-dimensional supersymmetric and formal field theory can be obtained um, in most circumstances by constructing a trial central charge, which is a functional of the possible two-dimensional R symmetries, and then extremizing over that space of R symmetries. A novel feature here is we're taking our four-dimensional field theory, um, which could have some, has an R symmetry, has some flavor symmetries, and now we're wrapping on a spindle the spindle also has an internal isometry. And that internal isometry corresponds to a possible, or we can have mixing of the two dimensional R symmetry with that internal symmetry direction as well. So what we need to do to calculate the two dimensional trial central charge is we have to start with the four dimensional anomaly polynomial and reduce on, on the spindle to get a two-dimensional anomaly polynomial, but we have to take into account that the, there is flux that's through the spindle. And um, a similar kind of calculation uh, was investigated by these authors in another, in a slightly different context. Um, 
but we have to do exactly the same thing. So you start with a four dimensional anomaly polynomial, which um, exists as a, a formal X six form on some six dimensional space. And that six dimensional space you need to consider as a vibration of a four dimensional space over the spindle, sorry, a spindle vibration over the four dimensional space um, associated with the fact that there's flux through the spindle. And you do a few more steps and that allows you to extract off the two dimensional anomaly polynomial and then allows you to do this C extremization. So in particular, once you have the two dimensional anomaly polynomial, you just take uh, the R trial, um, the, the trial R symmetry to be the four dimensional R symmetry plus a mixing with uh, J, which is the flavor symmetry associated to the rotations around uh, the spindle direction. And if you do that calculation, you find exactly uh, the central charge here, which I wrote down on the previous slide from the gravity side. And moreover, you get a mixing uh, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the extremal point, the mixing with epsilon here is given by this. And you can compare that also to the gravity side because there's a canonical, um, on the gravity side, there's the, the killing spinner uh, precisely captures a mixing uh, on the gravity side between the four dimensional asymmetry and um, the isometries of the spindle. So everything agrees exactly on the nose. And I think it's, this gives us um, strong confidence that this, this picture is holding together and that these new uh, ADS3 solutions or actually old ADS3 solutions from 2006 actually are dual to these CFTs uh, reduced on spindles. Okay. Um, well, there's, there's several open questions and I'll come back to some at the end of the talk, but just let me highlight one which may possibly the most interesting or outstanding here is, um, is whether or not there's black string solutions that start off at ADS5 in the UV um, and then go down to ADS3 cross sigma in the infrared. So in other words, this would be the flow across dimensions starting with some um, n equals one four dimensional field theory with the spindle uh, in the UV manifest and then flowing down to the CFT in the fi at fixed point, which we know is a solution. So this is some sort of generic, as uh, an example of a black strings solution. So that would be an, inter an interesting thing to construct. Um, so now I wanna move and give you a flavor of a corresponding story, which is actually very analogous for M brains wrapping on a spindle. Can I just ask a question? Maybe you'll sure. address this later, but will you be able to interpret this also in terms of D3 brains wrapping some cycles in some geometry? Or is this, you have to always look at the 4 n equals one gauge theory and then compactify this, right? It would be natural to ask, is there also brain picture? Yeah, so, so this, yeah, th this, if you could do this, this would make that manifest. Okay, so you don't um, know what is the geometric structure that you would have to have to have the Sasaki Einstein fiber of the spindle, and I guess there's a cone over that. Yeah, so, so that's a good question. I mean, yeah, we don't know the answer to that. I guess, and the related thing is, what is it that you would have to do to the n equals to four theory if, if you're wrapping these three brains that there is such a structure um, in terms of what replaces the topological twist? Yeah, that's a good question. So that's an outstanding question. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, so is there any more questions before I continue? Okay, so for the for the membranes, um, the the story is analogous, but there's a number of uh, interesting new features which are definitely worth highlighting. So the construction now is um, that we that we looked at was in four dimensional minimal gauge supergravity. So the Grangian is again just Einstein Hilbert term, negative cosmological constant, and uh, a Maxwell field, um, and we can uplift these 
any solution of this theory on a Sasaki Einstein 7. So we can again construct ADS2 cross spindle solutions. And the solution is actually very much like, I'll just quickly flash it up to remind you, it's very much, if I wrote it down, you wouldn't see at first glance any difference between this uh, solution here and the new one. The only difference is we'd have an ADS2 here and this, part, this would look pretty much the same, but the function Q here turns out to be a quartic rather than a cubic. So very, very similar at that level, um, but otherwise much the same. Once again, supersymmetry is not being realized by a topological twist. And again, that's the simplest way to see that is that the flux through the spindle is not the Euler character of the spindle. And once again, if we take a regular Sasaki Einstein 7, um, then the 11 dimensional solution is once again completely regular. So we have ADS2, roughly speaking, cross sigma cross Sasaki Einstein 7, and all the conical singularities of the spindle have got um, reabsorbed in a nice uh, regular nine dimensional manifold. And actually, these nine dimensional manifolds and these or these 11 dimensional solutions were again constructed back in 2006 in this old paper but we didn't have this or the, the new thing i'm emphasizing here is this new perspective of interpreting them as um uh or highlighting the spindle structure that's explicit in their construction as well so um that's th those features are much like what i was just saying describing for the d3 brains so what's the new features or the particularly new features the first is that um for ads2 solutions we can actually uh look at more general geometries or general solutions that also have rotations that are consistent with the ads2 symmetries so here i've written down the ads2 metric and y and z here is parameterizing the spindle, but I'm also allowing, this is in the four dimensional sense, nothing to do with the Sasaki Einstein. I'm also allowing this twisting of, um, or there's a, the, the spindle is fibered over the ADS2. And if this vibration is determined by this one form rho d tau, and if you take the field strength of rho d tau, that's the volume form of ADS2. It, so the point is that ansatz is consistent with the isometries of ADS2. And so correspondingly, that is also dual, well, it's dual to a conformal quantum mechanics to the same extent that any ADS2 solution is dual to conformal quantum mechanics. Um, so the generalization with rotation is something that went beyond the solutions we constructed in 2006 and was a new feature. The other new feature is we were able to identify not just infrared solutions, ADS2 cross sigma, but the full um, well, AUV completion. So we started ADS4 in the UV, and then we flow down to ADS2 cross spindle in the IR. So this will partially address or intersect with um, Zakura's question. Um, so ADS2 cross sigma in the infrared and ADS for on, on, the, on the boundary, this is also known as a black hole. So these are supersymmetric black hole solutions. What are they? In fact, these are solutions that go back to uh, 1976, um, constructed by Plavansky and Demiansky. So they cons considered um, solutions of the einstein maxwell theory, and they allowed for the possibility of cosmological constant, and particularly a negative cosmological constant. And the solutions of interest have five parameters, uh, which we can uh, think of as the mass of the black hole, the electric and magnetic charge, the rotation, and acceleration. So these are generalized C metrics. C metrics are metrics that are described accelerating black holes. And for people who know this stuff uh, in some sense, the one thing that we've set to zero is uh, a nut parameter. So these in these class of solutions, there was also an additional parameter, but we've set that parameter to zero because it gives rise to closed time curves, which we don't want. So if you take this five parameter family of solutions, which I won't write down explicitly, um, but let me just 
put it in another setting. If you set the acceleration to zero, you get the standard Kern-Newman ADS black holes with two sphere horizons. But if the acceleration is non-zero, then the two sphere, or it's associated with the two spheres having conical singularities. So you can think of uh, ADS space with a black hole in the middle and its horizon has these conical singularities and the singularities can be viewed as uh, one way to view it would be that there are um, deficits like strings which are pulling uh, the black hole and the net deficit is, is causing the acceleration in one direction or the other. And there's been a long, uh, well, there's been an enormous amount of work on uh, accelerating black holes and in particular, in particular, thinking about what to do with these uh, conical singularities. And one idea is you can think of um, desingularizing or, or making the, the conical deficits be associated with real cosmic strings. So you have black holes pierced by cosmic strings, which have a con give rise to a conical deficit, and that's giving rise to, um, a, 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 to pulling the black hole. Alternatively, you can desingularize by giving a physical source for the acceleration by embedding the black holes in electromagnetic fields. And there's a lot of work done on, on that. Here, what we have found sort of completely indirectly is the conical singularities can be completely removed by uplifting them on a Sasaki Einstein set. So the full four dimensional black hole uplifted on the Sasaki Einstein 7 is completely free of these conical singularities. And it's only after reducing on the Sasaki Einstein 7 that you, they become manifest. So that's an interesting, an interesting fact. Um, the supersymmetric and extremal black holes are actually given by a one dimensional, sorry, a one parameter family. And the one parameter family can be considered to be labeled by either the rotation or by the electric charge. Um, so the magnetic charge is given by the spindle flux as we had before. The spindle Euler character is given by this expression we had before. And for this one parameter family of supersymmetric extremal accelerating black holes, the angular momentum is related to the electric charge by this formula here. And the entropy of the black hole is associated to the electric and magnetic charge and the Euler character by this expression here. And if we just take these expressions and put QM equals zero, so get rid of the magnetic charge, and chi equals two. So if you'll notice from these formulas, if we just formally put n plus equals one and n minus equals one, then chi is two, QM equals zero. And moreover, these two formulas exactly collapse to the Kern-Newman case. So the Kern-Newman case, you've gotta be a little bit careful here because I've taken the spindle with the acceleration, quantized that, and during that construction, n plus and minus should not, were not equal to one, they were co-prime integers. Nevertheless, the key, these key final formula in, incorporate both the Kern-Newman construction when the acceleration is to zero to begin with, as well as this infinite family of black holes with spindle horizons. So it would, it would be very nice to construct um, or recover this entropy of these black holes from the dual boundary field theory. So the dual boundary field theory is um, the three-dimensional supersymmetric conformal field theory associated with ADS4 cross the Saki Einstein 7. And we would like, it would be very nice if there was one way through some uh, localization calculation of some form to recover this entropy of these black holes. So that's, that, that's an outstanding open issue. Um, but let me make one observation, which uh, seems important, is that when the rotation is non-zero, the conformal boundary is simply R cross the spindle. So in this setting, it looks like um, you see the, the spindle in, in the UV with the Sasaki Einstein 7 associated with it. If you switch off the angular momentum, which you might think is, is, should be simpler, 
um, it seems not to be the case. So if you take these solutions with, with this particular UV completion, um, when you set J equals zero, what you find is that the conformal boundary actually splits into two halves. And actually the way in which supersymmetry gets realized, if you, if you follow that limit, is you find that, that you're getting a, the spinner on the boundary is forming, becoming constant on, on one side and another constant on the other side. And the boundary is being split by an acceleration horizon in the bulk, which pierces the boundary, and you're getting topological twist on each half. So what that means as a UV solution, this is no good. Um, but it may also mean there's something significant about, um, I mean, there might be another UV completion, but it might be significant that it's saying that when the rotation is, is actually zero, it's thinking about the UV physics, uh, well, some newer insight is needed into, into the UV physics. Okay, um, how am I doing for time, Ibu? Oh, I, I, have I got, still got some good reasonable time? You have uh, five minutes, but you can go a little bit over. Okay. I won't be much more than five minutes. Let me just say um, uh, briefly then about the five brains wrapped on a spindle. And again, I just want to emphasize new features um, to the rather than the old features. So the D2 and D M, the D M2 and the D3 are similar because of their connection with Saki Einstein. The M5 doesn't have that feature. So the first point, um, five brains wrapped on a spindle, is there's no solutions in minimal gauge supergravity in seven dimension of the form ADS5 cross spindle. Why? I'm not sure, but there isn't. They're obstructed, or at least they're obstructed in, in the constructions that we had. So, but we can consider seven dimensional gauge supergravity with two gauge fields and correspondingly two scalar fields. We can uplift these solutions on, just on a four sphere. Um, and the construction of the spindle solutions goes through much the same way. It's a little bit more complicated because there's two gauge fields and actually the solutions um, uh, are global versions of some solutions con constructed by these people back in 2003. One thing that's particularly interesting about these constructions is the total magnetic flux that's through the spindle now is equal to the Euler character of the spindle. So this was not the case for the D3 brains and the M2 brains, but it is for the M5 brains. So this looks, and in fact, topologically, this is what you get for the topological twist. But here we don't have the topological twist because the killing spinners are not constant. So when you really do cancel out locally the spin connection and the gauge connection, um, then the spinners are constant. Here globally, we have, we're getting this, this uh, relationship, but not locally. So you might say topologically, we have a topological twist. So that's one interesting feature. Um, yeah, and okay, now we can uplift on the four sphere, but unlike the previous cases, uplifting on the four sphere does not give rise to a purely smooth regular geometry in 11 dimensions. The 11 dimensional geometry, uh, this should be five, which is ADS five cross, sigma, cross S4, roughly speaking, because the S4 is five but over the sigma, the 11 dimensional internal manifold has still has all the fold singularities. So without knowing exactly what to do with those, you can nevertheless still go ahead and calculate the acentral charge and you get this complicated looking formula, which is specified by N plus or minus, P1 and P2 are the fluxes through the spindle, constrained by this, this condition here. And S, which is appearing here, is some irrational number depending on that data. It's just some answer, but it's uh, a quadratic irrational number. But we can match that, and I won't go through any details, but it's we can match that with a field theory calculation. So we start with the six dimensional zero two comma uh, zero two supersymmetric conformal field theory. And now we use uh, a, ma a maximization of um, interligator and vect. And it's much the same as what I was just describing for the D3 brains with C extremizations. We want to do the uh, 
X romanization, this should have been an A here, uh, over the possible R symmetries, taking into account that we have flux through the spindle and correspondingly that there can be a mixing of the R symmetry with the internal uh, isometry directions. And if you do that calculation, you get exact agreement with the gravity side, giving us confidence that that supergravity solution with orbital singularities um, is capturing a jewel of this field theory. Okay, so just some final comments. I think I have three slides just to, to wrap up and summarize. So um, we've wrapped D3 brains and membranes on spindles. Um, we have supersymmetry without the usual topological twist. Um, and a number of further generalizations have been exp uh, explored uh, in these papers um, here. But the D3 brains and M2 brains, if you uplift with regular Sasaki Einstein metrics, the upstairs metric can be completely regular. So it's an interesting question. When does this happen more generally? Um, if we're wrapping orbital folds downstairs, um, what are the rules and, and general significance of this fact? This ties in with a, um, a bigger program, which I've also been working on over the last couple of years um, with uh, Sparks and Martelli and Chris Cousins and in a number of papers. And it goes back to uh, understanding some geometry, which uh, Naku Kim and then I, in 2007, uh, started working on or explicating, which it, it's a sort of a, a lower dimension. It's a, it's a, a version, a variation of Sasaki Einstein geometry, which slots into ADS3 solutions and ADS2 solutions of D equals 10 and D equals 11, just like Sasaki Einstein slots into ADS5 and ADS4 solutions of, of the same theories. Um, and there's certainly things to be understood in this program of understanding these geometries, GK7, GK9, systematically using toric geometry, for example, and other tools that we've been exploring these papers of, of understanding where spindles fit in. Um, from the field theory point of view, there's questions about how, what are the rules, and maybe people here have some thoughts about this. Um, if, we, if we place, say, just N equals four Yang Mills theory, where we have a nice uh, Lagrangian field theory description, what are the rules for placing these field theories on, on orbifolds? What, what, are there extra degrees of freedom at the orbifold points, or how should they be thought about? Um, some of the, the supergravity constructions suggest that some of the supersymmetric and formal field theories are obstructed. Why is that? That's another open question. We can also wrap the five brains on spindles. Um, there was no ADS5 cross sigma solutions in minimal D equals seven gauge supergravity. It's unclear why that is. Um, we don't have the topological twist as usual but we have topologically a topological twist. So there's two ways of um, realizing supersymmetry that we've discovered. And there's maybe more um, in the context of, um, of these spindles. These 11 mental solutions have orbifold singularities, but they seem relatively benign and ADS-CFT seems to be working reasonably well. Again, what are the rules more generally? Um, Another interesting question. I also mentioned something about UV completions. Um, for the M2 brains, we have this nice uh, UV completion because we uh, found the accelerating black holes with magnetic electric charge and rotation, moreover, provide a nice UV completion for the ADS2 cross sigma spindles in the infrared. It would be nice to recover the entropy using uh, the many developments that have been pursued for understanding the entropy of black holes for um, Kern-Newman black holes. And just one thing that we did in a paper with David, David Kasani and James and Dario, generalizing some work of these authors was to recover the entropy of the black hole by um, finding complex saddle points of the gravitational uh, partition function. 
So I, I won't say anything more about that because it's sort of a, an, an, another direction. But um, it was possible to, to extend the, the results of these people for Kern Newman black holes uh, into, the, into the realm of these accelerating black holes. Um, that also opened up some additional puzzles, um, which you can ask me about afterwards if you're interested. For the D3 brains in particular and the M5 brains also, we don't have any analog of these UV completions. I, I think they probably exist, um, but the fact that when you switch off the rotation in this case, the boundary starts to become a bit sick, suggests that there might be some subtleties here and that well, may, well, may well connect with Sakura's question of exactly determining what's happening with the, um, the brain picture. The M5 brain picture might be a little bit more benign because um, it, it has this topological, topological twist feature and maybe that's useful in extending out towards the UV. Everything I've said in this talk is obviously to just being to do with the two-dimensional spindle specified by two integers M plus or minus. But once you start seeing this story seem, seemingly uh, making sense uh, in all directions, it's natural to wonder about, is there analogous constructions when we take say three-dimensional orbifolds or four-dimensional orbifolds and, do, and, and look for similar constructions? So hopefully that's giving the flavor of what we've been up to. And I suppose the main new message is that there seems to be a, an interesting new landscape uh, to explore. And I'll stop there. Let's thank uh, Jerome. And then we'll take uh, questions few questions and then we'll stop the recording and there'll be free open discussion for a while. Um, well, since uh... You, Ibu, won't ask this question. I, I would ask it. So um, Ibu had a, a similar sounding paper with um, Bonetti, Minasen, and Nardoni, where they also had they they seem to well Ibu will correct me if I'm wrong, but they it looked at like a similar solution where they had two uh, points, two special points on a sphere that they called um, that they interpreted as. Um, an irregular puncture and, and another one is a regular one, if I understand correctly. Uh, any relation, any, um, I mean, so in particular for the, um, you had also this ADS5 solutions, uh, which you would like to interpret as an equal one, a dual to an equal one theories, if I understand correctly, that uh, you obtain by wrapping the 2,0 SCFT on a sphere with two points, but then what? Uh, what is the interpretation of those special points? Are they also some punctures uh, in the? You know how did how does it fit in in, you know, in the plus S story of absing them? And equal one ana analogous um, analog of the plus S. Yeah. So I, well, Ibu might <coughs> want to answer this question, but. Um, yeah, so our solutions have, have the spindle with, uh, yeah, topology of the two sphere with the two orbital points, and the S4 is fibered over that. And the, the full six dimensional solution that continues to have orbital singularities and it fits into that general classification of ADS5 cross M6 solutions that we had many years ago. But I, I think the, the solutions that uh, Igor and collaborators have it. Are certainly different. They are, well, they are different to these ones. But maybe you want to make a, a comment. Yeah, I can make a comment. I mean, the sort of um, the solutions that at least uh, Alessandro are talking about, um, you can think of taking your spindle and cutting it in half. Then what you call the flux becomes a just the holonomy that you put around, and then you're just left with the extra point on top, which you can put the orbifold there or not. So it's the same logic if looking at ADS5 times some sigma, but 
as, as you pointed out, if Sigma is a spindle, you can't find a solution, but I think I understand why that is. Maybe we can discuss after the recording. Um, but, but if you just look for a spinner, you can find a non-trivial spinner, but then the topology of this thing is a disk, not, a, not, a, not an S2. So it seems to me some, some, somewhat more like a, a, a defect, but um, because you have uh, the I, I, Yeah, so, so we have the boundary, but, but, but in, in, the, in the general case where you have um, the sphere with, with this, this, this spindle, it's still interpret, you can still, I think, interpret this as a wrapping brain on a sphere with punctures, but these are punctures of n equal to one pi. And I can argue other evidence why that should be the right picture. So I guess, sorry, to clarify, and part of my question was how uh, do these, I mean, it wasn't so much a question to Ibu, and that, although I'm happy that he uh, chimed in, but the, um, I guess my, part of my question was how do these solutions fit in the um, class S story or narrative? I'm not sure. That's a, that, I'm not sure how that, uh, yeah, it's an open question. But I guess they should, right? You're claiming yeah, they should. Yeah, I think yeah, they, 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 they should. Maybe there's some are. variation because of the orbifold singularities. But I mean, so that these are not punctures. No. Okay. So, yeah. I, <laughs> I, I think they are. I, I, I have uh, evidence to okay. that they are. Okay. Okay, I was hoping to. <laughs> To make some noise here, and I guess I managed. Uh, well, so before, so I see Emil has another question, but I just wanted to add a, a little provocation. So, uh, sorry, before you do, just what, one more comment. I mean, the construction that I described I, I, it was a bit rushed, but um, it was in this uh, non minimal gauge supergravity with two gauge fields. So, mm -hmm. generically, they're n equals one, but there is yep. a subclass which is n equals two. So that, that particular ah. subclass would be the one that's most easy to... Yeah, yeah, but they specified that there's also an n equal one, due to Ibu, um, there's yeah. a, uh, an n equal one analog of the class S story, um, which I guess right. I could have called the, a BBBW instead of class S, but uh, okay, so it's a thing that, uh, there's a similar question there, but, but thank you. Yeah, for, maybe uh, we can have this discussion after the recording. Yeah, so then, the, uh, the other... Have more people ask questions. Did, did, did. So the, uh, the other, uh, the leader provocation I wanted to um, uh, to make is that perhaps we should uh, we should call uh, shouldn't the definition of topological twist be topological? So I understand <laughs> I understand that um, we are used to have uh, having the spinos um, uh, constant, but perhaps we should grandfather in uh, these uh, new cases that you have and call them topological twist nevertheless. Anyway, so I yeah, that's do not set up and um, uh, I, I, yeah, we well, we can discuss it afterwards. We weren't sure yeah. whether people would be happy to <laughs> give up. Yeah, uh, I mean, then there's a provocation. <laughs> Emo, hi, hi. Uh, I was my ears perked up in your introduction when you said that these at least some of these flows realize dimensional reduction. Um, so in what sense are you losing dimensions of the target space? Is it, the, is it that the warping is, um, you know, sending some dimensions to, to sort of zero proper size at some too fast a rate or what, what how should I think of it? Uh, um, may, maybe in a simpler setting, in a simpler way. I mean, all I'm saying is that at, at the ADS boundary, the, um, the slicing is, I mean, take ADS uh, five, for example, instead of having R13 slices, or, or let's take the, the black hole case, because that's even more concrete, because we have the solution. So at the ADS four boundary, and uh, instead of it looking like R1 comma uh, two, it looks like R cross spindle or, or Riemann surface. And then you go into the horizon and it becomes uh, ADS two cross uh, spindle or horizon. That, that's all I meant. So, I mean, so th th that you, you're imposing boundary conditions on the ADS boundary such that you have compactified by hand because the, the, the boundary is saying it, the conformal boundary is a bit of Minkowski space cross the compact space. 
and then you're seeing where that where that goes to in the infrared infrared set by the scale of that uh, um, compact space. So, so what's happening in the infrared? Um, well, you, you have you just you you realize a conformal field theory of lower dimensions. Okay, so that that's that's all that you meant, though. I mean, that's like all the, I meant. The, the, okay, the bulk isn't changing dimension. No, 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 no. Okay. All right. Thanks. Yeah, sorry. Okay, if there are any questions, let's thank Jerome again for the really nice talk. Thanks. <laughs>